Yes? Okay. Well, um, thank you everyone for coming today. I have never seen this lecture hall so full. Um, so I'm, I'm Joy. I am a, a recent graduate of this department. And I want to welcome you all to this very, very, very anticipated event that we have. Um, a shocking amount of people actually signed up to watch this. I think over 2,000 people have signed up to watch the live stream. So it is really, really incredible to see all your faces here. Um, and I think it's probably a testament to this growing sense of urgency. Um, you know, the questions that we're grappling here today, I think, are really reflective of the sense that, especially after the summer, we can't ignore any longer that something is going wrong. Um, if you guys have been following the news in Pakistan, you know, scenes flooding out of Pakistan kind of feel almost like we're watching a sci-fi post-apocalyptic movie, except it's actually happening and it's happening today. This summer, we've seen floods in Sudan, in China, Germany, Europe, US, heat waves across the entire world. It has been a devastating summer, um, to say the least. But I do not intend to kick this event off with this uh, doom and gloom attitude. But actually, we're here today because we're not here to talk about the end of the world. We're here to talk about what comes next and what we can do how we can intentionally and purposefully design and build a better world. Uh, so it is with my great pleasure and honor that I'll introduce our three guests here today. Um, so first we have Sam Finkhauser, who will be arguing for green growth. Now Sam Finkhauser is a professor at climate economics and policy here at the University of Oxford. He's also the research director of Oxford Net Zero and before joining this uh, beautiful Oxford institution, he was the director at Grantham Research Institute um, on climate change and the environment at the London School of Economics, where he is still a visiting professor. Next, we have Kate, who will be moderating and guiding the discussion. So Kate Rayworth is a renegade economist who is looking to design economics to bring us forth into the 21st century. You guys might have uh, come across her brainchild and concept, Donut Economics, which is about how to bring humanity into a space that is not just ecologically safe, but socially just. And lastly, we have Jason Hickel, who is, uh, he's a professor, he's an economist, he's an anthropologist. He's currently a professor at the Institute for Environmental Science and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. He's also a visiting senior fellow uh, at the International Inequalities Institute at the London School of Economics. And you guys might have read his books, The Divide, which is a searing indictment on global inequality, and Less is More, which I believe you guys will all get a taste of today. Now, clearly, the three of them have more acronyms and accolades that, than I have the brain capacity to memorize. So I'm going to hand it off to them. But quickly before I do that, I just want to run through the uh, order of events for today. So we're going to quickly open with introductory remarks. Then we're going to move into a moderated discussion. And then after that, we'll open up the floor for a Q&A panel. And lastly, I just, again, want to thank you all for showing up here today. Without public participation in these types of conversations, it is not really possible to achieve transformative change. So thank you for showing up, and also for the hundreds of people who are watching this online. Also, thank you for joining us. Thank you to our camera crew back there who are making it possible to be accessible to the public. Um, thank you to School of Geography and Environment and the Smith School, to Mark Hirons, our course director, for helping facilitate this. Um, also, a shout out to my dear friend and colleague, Nanak Narula, who was you know, a champion for this event, and this event would not have happened without him. Fortunately, he can't not be here today. And lastly, thank you to our speakers for embracing the responsibility to come out and guide this discussion for us today. All right, hand it off.
thank you, Joy. And let me start by thanking you and Nanak and all the students who've been involved in organising this event. As is so wonderfully the case these days, it's so often students who are bringing the really critical discussions into the university. So thank you for making this happen just at the time that you should be handing in your dissertations. <laughs> So, welcome to everybody here. This room is packed and I have no doubt the lines are crackling online and it should be because this is a critical conversation. We are going to have a critical debate and discussion and I'm going to lean us towards discussion around this topic. As Joy just set out, we know these are extraordinarily challenging, devastating times. The climate and ecological crisis is no longer something we imagine, it's in everyday's headlines. There's been human suffering for millennia, but it is so visible to us all now. And it's right in our own high income countries where we may no longer have expected it to be. So how do we meet the needs of all people within the means of the planet, as I would put it? How do we do that? It's so clear we need an economic transformation, but what kind? And there are, of course, at least two very compelling different perspectives on this. And it's brilliant that we have both Sam and Jason here today, two of the leading proponents of both of these perspectives. So I'm really looking forward to the debate we're going to have. Now, the, the, the title that's put up here is How to Save the Planet. I reckon the planet, if she were here, she might say, I'll do me, you do you. <laughs> because she's going to evolve and look after herself. So I just want to nuance this theme so that we don't end up debating about how to save the planet, OK? So I'm going to say, Perhaps we can, and, and I think Jason and Sam have already agreed, just to nuance it a little bit. How do we secure a thriving future for humanity and the rest of the living world? Whatever that means, that thriving future. How do we secure a thriving future for humanity and the rest of the living world? Is it through the vision of green growth, which Sam is going to set out for us? Or is it through a vision of degrowth that Jason's going to set out for us? Now, we are really lucky to have two of the best proponents of this in the room. And I think we're even more lucky to be doing this in a university setting, because debates like this are 10 a penny on the radio or in TV, but they last about seven minutes and they are rhetorical, they are snap, they are quick, and they're often, there's no room for being reflective. But we have the privilege here in a university setting of respectful disagreement. And asking ourselves, how can it be that two highly informed people, and by the way, all of you holding very different views, how can it be that people with so much information and opportunity to learn and understand can reasonably hold such different perspectives about the future? So in the words of the slam poet Taylor Marley, changing your mind is one of the best ways of finding out whether or not you still have one. So I invite you as an audience, as you listen to this conversation, I invite each one of us first to appreciate what you hear in both of these perspectives and aim to appreciate even more what you hear in the perspective you don't think you agree with. I invite you to listen for the deeper roots of disagreement. Is it over different definitions? Are they talking about different regions of the world? Are they focusing on different ecological challenges? Is it different beliefs about human motivation or possible futures in terms of technological and political and economic and social scenarios or something else? Why do people disagree? And I invite you to ask yourself as we talk, what would it take for you to change your mind on these topics? So as Joyce said, we're gonna kick off, Sam's going to launch us with 10 minutes putting forward a perspective on why a thriving future is best secured through pursuing green growth. Then Jason will propose why it might be through degrowth. Then we'll have a conversation. I'm going to invite you to have a quick buzz conversation with each other. Just what are you hearing? And then we'll open up to questions. OK, everybody in the room. So listen with your best ears. Come up with the best questions that you think will help us all go even deeper into this so that we all leave with more understanding and more appreciation and a better thought of what we do next. OK, with that, Sam, would you like to kick us off? Thanks, Kate. And let me also start with a word of congratulations to, uh, to Joy Nanak and the student team for organizing what must be the event of the summer. Also <laughs> for uh, surrounding me on this panel with you know, the, the A-list of people on this topic. So well done on that. 
So I'm going to make the case for green growth or climate compatible growth as it's known in one of the programs I'm involved in, which is sort of sponsoring what I'm doing. I'm going to start with some perhaps sort of more conceptual things in, in search of things that we might agree on. Uh, but I'm, just because that might be boring, I will then work out the things we don't. And then I want to also uh, finish on a few words on climate change. And, and there I'm hoping to say things that we definitely disagree on. So that's the plan. Um, some, some of the sort of more conceptual things where I, where I assume we, we are in agreement. The first one of those is that the GDP is a lousy measure of human progress and prosperity. I assume we are degrowing GDP. We could degrow other things, but I assume we are, uh, we are degrowing GDP. And uh, most people, including most economists, would agree that the GDP is a measure of economic activity. It's the pile of stuff that an economy produces. It's not a measure of prosperity or human welfare or human happiness. Um, now, that's not a particularly novel or controversial statement. Uh, each, economists, each economist probably learns, learns that in Economics 101, you're being given the reasons why uh, what, what's all excluded in GDP, uh, unpaid work, uh, defensive expenditures are in there uh, and, 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 and sort of wealth is not there, flows are in there. We learned that a car crash is a good thing for GDP. It gives income to the doctor and the car mechanic and clearly there's something, something wrong there. But again, that's not the, sort of a controversial thing to say. Most people will ag agree with that. And there are measures on, uh, in the making which are hugely important to have a broader dashboard of uh, human uh, development of prosperity, of progress, and um, the system of environmental economic accounts, for example, the human development indicators. So those are all, uh, that's all stuff we need more of and need to pay more attention to. So I think that we agree on. Um, let me now add the nuance on, on GDP. Um, it so happens, in my opinion, that a lot of things that we do care about actually are correlated uh, with GDP. And the reason why I say that is that GDP isn't just the pile of things we produce. Uh, there's another way in which you can uh, measure GDP, and that's in the sources of income uh, uh, producing these things generate. So it's the sum of wages, of, of, of rents, of, of profits, of taxes. And it so turns out that the income is correlated with a lot of things we care about. Health outcomes. Uh, Health care is expensive. COVID uh, 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 vaccines were expensive. Uh, uh, poverty outcomes, uh, clearly income uh, helps on poverty outcomes. Uh, the one close to my heart, climate, uh, climate outcomes, climate vulnerability uh, tends to, or adaptive capacity tends to improve uh, with income. So we, we have uh, that sort of empirical evidence. No, it's correlation, it's just a correlation. And you can find exceptions to uh, each one of those rules, but exceptions are just that, they're exceptions. Uh, as, a, as a broad trend, it turns to be the case that if you have less of a budget constraint, if you have more income, some problems are easier to solve. So that's the GDP story. Um, the second thing where I uh, am pretty sure we agree on is that uh, uh, economic activity must, uh, must respect planetary boundaries. That for me is a given. So we're not talking about Singapore on Thames, Sunak versus Trust type growth. We're talking about green growth. We're talking about growth that understands uh, planetary boundaries and lives within those planetary boundaries. So you can think of a sort of you optimize uh, happiness or prosperity, however you want to measure it, subject to a binding constraint so that you stay within your planetary uh, boundaries. And it's then an empirical question. Either prosperity goes up or it stays constant or it comes down. GDP, which isn't the same as prosperity, either goes up or comes down. It becomes an empirical question. I would say, I would probably agree with Trace, and if you look at the very, very long run, there must surely be at some point limits to, uh, to growth because uh, if you sort of GDP that grows at two and a half percent or prosperity that grows at two and a half percent increases by a factor 10 over a century. So that's a factor 100 over two centuries and a factor 1000 over three. So clearly you sort of expect somewhere at some point this thing will have to level off. But you know human ingenuity is, is a wonderful thing. 
Um, Thomas Malthus, 200 years ago, thought that there would be constraints uh, to agricultural productivity in terms of poverty and population control. Turns out he was wrong. Um, another example that I quite like is the sort of the, the productivity uh, improvements in, in, in knowledge generation. If you think about all the information that we ping around in, 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 in Twitter, uh, on, on social media, the stuff that's being live streamed now, if you had to uh, communicate that in the way of the 19th, 19th century, you have a post rider on a horse. The number of horses you would need to communicate all that would be wholly unsustainable. Um, the amount of food you would need for those horses, completely unsustainable. But we have found a way of communicating, of making communication work within environmental constraints. There are other examples that, that very, I think we've solved them while remaining prosperous. Um, <coughs> ozone layer depletion is usually a, a, a good example. Also, the hole in the ozone layer is, is closing. Uh, one of the reasons why it's closing, uh, scholars who have looked at that, people like Scott Barrett, will tell you one of the reasons why this was a problem that could be solved uh, was that there was an industrial solution, industry bought into it. There was a green growth <coughs> solution to it, which made it easier. There's another reason that is it killed rich people, but the, 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 green growth, <laughs> the green growth reason played a role as well. So those are some of the nuances that make me believe environmental boundaries matter. Perhaps we can grow at least for a, a little bit longer within them. Let me know how much time do I have left? Five minutes. Okay, perfect, half time. Um, so let me now turn to climate change, where, where I uh, will make three statements where I'm pretty sure we're going to disagree. The first statement is that we can solve climate change without degrowth. I will then sort of say that uh, a little bit of income growth, a little bit more prosperity actually helps in solving climate change. And finally, I'm going to say the green or the, the degrowth narrative is absolutely disastrous in the politics of climate change. So let me let me expand on, on, on those three points. Uh, can we solve climate change without degrowth? Uh, we have a lot of, you know, there's a cottage industry of people who calculate uh, uh, decarbonization paths, who calculate how we can technologically, economically, behaviorally uh, bring our uh, economies down to net zero by the middle of the century. Those solutions the International Energy Agency has, has produced those pathways. In the UK, the Committee on Climate Change has produced those pathways. They achieve that environmental objective. They stay within that particular planetary boundary without damaging prosperity. It costs a little bit, but it doesn't sort of affect prosperity in the long run. How do they do that? They do that by uh, focusing not on reducing GDP, but on two other factors that sort of determine carbon emissions. One is uh, the amount of carbon that goes into energy, if we just talk about energy-related emissions for a moment, the amount of carbon that goes into energy can be radically reduced, can be reduced to things like renewable electric vehicles, moving to hydrogen and so on. So you can radically reduce carbon per unit of energy. You can also reduce the amount of energy per GDP, that's the resource efficiency, the energy efficiency, where you can do a huge amount still more than we have done so far. And if you reduce those two, you can bring emissions down by enough that you don't have to tinker a lot with GDP. That's what those sorts of uh, paths, and they're sort of modeled, they're, they're, you know, they're scientific, they're technologically, economically uh, grounded models. They tell you that this, uh, that this is feasible. And they also tell you that it generates economic opportunities. It generates new jobs. Uh, it generates uh, sort of Schumpeterian uh, growth spurts that, uh, that, that sort of a bit like the iPhone or IT have, have generated innovation and made us more prosperous. Clean technology can do the same thing. So that's my first climate point. You can actually solve the problem uh, without degrowth. You can solve it through green growth. The second point was that a little bit of growth or a little bit more income is actually a good thing to solve to go down that path. And the reason for that is that all those solutions that we talked about, the ones I just mentioned, 
renewable energy, um, electric vehicles, a hydrogen economy. Um, if you want to convert our capital stock, our stock of infrastructure that we have today, if you want to convert that to green, that's going to cost, people have estimated these things, that's going to cost trillions uh, of dollars of investment a year. Uh, that capital has to come from somewhere. And there's yet another way in which you can uh, calculate GDP. It isn't just the stuff of things. You can also calculate GDP by asking what, what we use uh, the GDP for. And that's the sum of consumption plus investment plus government expenditure. That also gives you GDP. Now, I just told you you need a hell of a lot more investment. You need a hell of a lot more of government expenditure. How do you do that? If you, how do you increase the slice of that in the pie if you also shrink the pie? It makes it so much more difficult. It also makes it more difficult politically. That's another empirical observation that, that we have, that people's interest in environmental problems, wrongly in my opinion, but it's an empirical observation, people's interest in environmental problems goes down in economically difficult times. Uh, we sort of did the statistic, the number of climate change laws that were passed in the world, most of those laws were passed in economically good times. In the share of, uh, in the relative share, the laws passed in economically difficult times is a lot less. So people's attention uh, wanders to more important or short term more important things when the economy is bad. So again, a little bit of growth, however measured, prosperity, however measured, makes it easier uh, to solve the climate change problem. My final point, the one I'm sort of making deliberately most provocatively, is that the politics of green growth is just disastrous for the climate change you problem. Degrowth. Degrowth. <laughs> Ooh, Freudian slip. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> Freudian slip. The, uh, the, the, the politics of degrowth is, is disastrous, just to make, be very clear about that. And why, why do I uh, say that? Um, there is a, a sort of Look at, look at the narrative that, uh, that uh, skeptics of net zero use. The whole narrative that they use is about this is a story of hardship. Here's a bunch of zealots who want to take away your stake, your job, your holiday and your car. And it's an incredibly effective narrative. People listen to that and they start having second thoughts. You can go, and I did that, it's a sort of a perverse kind of pleasure. Um, I went to the, uh, a website of Net Zero Skeptics. It's called Net Zero Watch. That's the, the UK uh, MPs who are critical of the Net Zero. And you just go through their Twitter account, and it's one statement after the other, after the other, after the other, that says about uh, Britain's economic suicide plan is the Net Zero plan. They talk about Biden's green energy agenda is a beeline for degrowth. So their whole narrative, their whole way of fighting what we have to do so urgently is a story of degrowth. Uh, and, and so you just basically play into that narrative. You, you just make their job so much easier if you tell a story of misery, of hardship, when you can tell a story of prosperity. So we have a problem to solve here. We have 30 years to solve it. It's a difficult problem. Why do you make it pragmatically why do you make that problem more difficult than you have to? Why do you tell a story of hardship that turns people off when you can tell a story of prosperity, which happens to be true, that makes people excited about it? Let me stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Can I ask for just one point of clarification? So at the beginning you said uh, green growth is climate compatible growth but then you also said well it's actually growth that would happen within all planetary boundaries I happen here's some planetary boundaries I whipped up I, I, I was waiting for yeah, the, I had the props to, bring it to out. come out right. <laughs> so so but then when you were giving us the examples of the, the scenarios that show that it's possible to have radical reductions in environmental impacts compatible with growth you you were using um carbon emissions data, I think, or you were speaking to carbon emissions, so this one. So I just wanted to ask whether you believe or have seen or, or, or believe there will be evidence, not just on climate, on carbon emissions, but on material footprint, on fertilizer use, on water use, that these also can be radically reduced within a growing economy. 
Yeah, that, that's a good point. If you look at your, your, uh, your, your donut there, um, I talked about ozone layer depletion, um, climate change, air pollution. Those are all things we can solve very easily within a, a, a green growth framework. Ocean acidification, to some extent, to a large extent, is CO2 related, yes. climate related, so that will solve itself as well. So for me, the difficult ones, water, fresh water withdrawal can, can probably be done as well through uh, efficiency. Okay. measures so the difficult ones for me is biodiversity loss uh, the, the the nitrogen uh, uh, cycle those are those for me are the difficult one the other ones i am very convinced we can solve them with green growth no problem at all great thank you and just hearing your your take on degrowth i think one of the i'm going to guess that one of the sources of where we our disagreement may be is around a definition of what's meant by degrowth for which I'm going to turn to Jason to set out his perspective. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, is it okay if I stand? To, Absolutely, to, go for it. Just so I can Wherever you would like to. Um, and will I have a chance to respond to points made by Absolutely. Sam? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, you can respond now or you can set out your perspective. Whatever you, you think is the best. After. You I'll talk first. Whatever you'd like. Give us the degrowth perspective. I shall. Rather than just and let me take water. <laughs> Okay, it's, it's so good to see you all, and thank you for coming. And greetings to all of you who are following online. Um, so let's see, this is very challenging, because this is a, a big and difficult topic that I have to now present in 10 minutes, which is hard. Uh, but let me try. Uh, we stand at a difficult juncture in history. To quote Antonio Gramsci, the old world is dying, and the new world is struggling to be born. So let's start with the old world. The global economy is driving dangerous ecological breakdown. With existing government policies, we're headed for 3.2 degrees of global heating this century, within the lifetimes of present generations. Humans have never lived on such a planet. Scientists warn of severe displacement, crop yield decline, species extinction, and political upheaval. And climate is not the only crisis that we face. We're also overshooting five other planetary boundaries, including a staggering collapse of biodiversity. This is not because of ignorance or individual behavior or a lack of concern. It is due to structural features of the capitalist economy. And by capitalism here, I do not mean markets and trade and businesses. These existed for thousands of years before capitalism, and they're innocent enough on their own. What distinguishes capitalism from other economic systems is that it is organized around and dependent on perpetual growth, ever increasing levels of industrial production. It's the first and only intrinsically expansionary economic system in history. If it does not grow, it collapses into crisis, which happens, of course, every few years, with devastating consequences for working class people and the poor. This system is profoundly unstable. Crucially, also, capitalism is undemocratic. Decisions about what to produce and how to use labor and resources are controlled by the 1% who own the majority of corporate shares and who appoint the directors of firms. And as far as they are concerned, the purpose of increasing production is not primarily to improve people's lives or to achieve specific social goals. It is not about use value or social progress. Rather, for them, it is to extract and accumulate an ever-increasing quantity of profit. That is the overriding objective. And this leads to perverse forms of production such as SUVs instead of public transit or gadgets designed to break down and increase product turnover. The result is that we have an economy that massively overuses resources and energy, and yet remarkably, nonetheless still fails to meet basic human needs. It is dangerously inefficient. Now, scientists are clear that it is the rich economies of the global north that are, the, that are overwhelmingly responsible for the ecological crisis. Their use of energy and resources is extremely high and vastly in excess of what we know is required to meet human needs even at a good standard. What is more, growth in the global north relies on a large net appropriation from the global south. This is draining poor countries of resources and energy necessary for development, colonizing their atmosphere and ecosystems, and offshoring the social and ecological costs of growth onto vulnerable communities. And yet note that despite this immense 
production and appropriation. In the US, which is the richest country in the world, a quarter of all people live in substandard housing. Half cannot afford health care. In the UK, we have 4.3 million children living in poverty. Why? It's because the enormous productive capacity of these countries is organized in the interests of capital rather than in the interests of people. So what do we do? What does the new world look like? For 50 years, our ruling classes have promised that green growth will save us. They say that efficiency improvements will allow capital to continue increasing production and profits while at the same time reducing ecological impact to sustainable levels. It sounds nice, but of course it hasn't happened. And now scientists are challenging this narrative on empirical grounds. Let's start with emissions. We know, of course, that it is possible to absolutely decouple GDP from emissions. If that wasn't possible, we'd be doomed. And this happens by shifting to cleaner energies. Indeed, several nations are already on this path. But what we face here is a question of speed. To meet the Paris Agreement target, we have to cut emissions in half in seven years and reach zero by 2050. And remember, that is a global average target. Rich countries must decarbonize faster than this since they've contributed most to cumulative emissions. That's a basic climate justice principle. This requires a rapid rate of mitigation. Uh, and growth makes this task extremely difficult. The reason is because more production means more energy demands. And more energy demands makes decarbonization harder to achieve. It's like trying to run down an escalator that is accelerating upward against you. Green growth proponents know this problem. And they deal with it in several ways that are apparent in the green growth scenario models. First, they assume efficiency improvements big enough to achieve an unprecedented decoupling of GDP or production from energy to an extent that is not supported by the empirical literature. And the main problem here is that in a growth-oriented economy, savings from efficiency are leveraged to expand the process of production and accumulation, thus wiping out many of the gains. The second feature is that these green growth scenarios assume a mass deployment of speculative negative emissions technologies, mostly in the form of BECS, which stands for bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. Right? This would require biofuel plantations up to three times the size of India, with substantial deforestation, biodiversity loss, and constraints on human food systems. So you solve one crisis while exacerbating others. Moreover, BEX is unproven at scale. And if it fails, we're stuck in a hothouse trajectory from which it would be impossible for us to escape. This is a dangerous gamble with the future of human civilization and all of life on Earth. Third, green growth scenarios maintain excess energy privilege in the global north and among the rich by suppressing energy use in the global south and by appropriating southern land for biofuel plantations. That's built into these models. This approach perpetuates colonial inequalities. It is clearly immoral and unjust. Finally, even if we imagine these problems away, we have to deal with another issue. Regardless of the type of energy that we use, more growth means more material extraction, which is the single biggest driver of biodiversity loss and ecosystem damage. Several major scientific reports in recent years have found that sufficient reductions in material use are unlikely to be achieved if growth continues as it is in rich nations, even in high efficiency scenarios. This is not good enough. We can and we must do better. In our vision for the new world, we must be attentive to scientific evidence and insistent on global justice. In its latest report, the IPCC points out that scholarship in degrowth offers an alternative. Now, some people will quickly assume that degrowth is somehow anti-technology. This is not accurate. In fact, degrowth embraces efficiency improvements and feasible and safe technological change. But it recognizes that this alone is not enough and therefore also calls for rich nations to transition to a post-capitalist eco-social economy, abandon growth as an objective, and focus instead on equity, sufficiency, and human well-being. We need to, re uh, to recognize that when it comes to well-being, it's not aggregate 
production that matters. What matters is what we are producing, whether people have access to essential goods they require, and how income is distributed. This focuses the mind on what is important. And the first step is that we need to decommodify and expand essential public services, healthcare, education, housing, public transit, energy, water, internet, nutritious food. Mobilize the productive forces to ensure that everyone has what they need to live a good life, regardless of fluctuations in aggregate output. This stabilizes the economy, directly cuts the cost of living, and improves the welfare purchasing power of income. Second, introduce the public job guarantee with workplace democracy and living wages to empower people to participate in the most important collective projects of our generation, building renewable energy capacity, insulating homes, restoring ecosystems. This approach abolishes economic insecurity, improves the bargaining power of labor, delivers high levels of well-being, and enables us to pursue radical climate action without anyone getting hurt. This is the bread and butter of a just transition. In other words, we need to improve socially necessary sectors. And with this foundation in place, we can then scale down socially less necessary forms of production. Private jets, SUVs, air travel, mansions, beef, fast fashion, single-use packaging, advertising, and obviously the widespread practice of planned obsolescence. In other words, forms of production that are organized around capital accumulation and elite consumption, and which are largely irrelevant to human well-being. As part of this, we can, of course, also introduce policy to extend product lifespans and guarantee rights to repair. If our products last twice as long, we will consume half as many. Right? Next, we need to curtail the purchasing power of the rich using policy tools such as wealth taxes and maximum income ratios. This may sound radical, but think about it. It is irrational and unjust to continue to devote energy and resources to supporting an overconsuming class in the middle of an ecological emergency. Now, this is powerful in terms of climate mitigation because policies like these would dramatically reduce energy use and allow us to achieve a much faster transition to renewables. And as our society requires less aggregate production, we can shorten the working week, give people more free time, and share necessary labor more evenly. This approach has been shown to have a strong positive effect on health, mental well-being, and gender equality. Finally, the central pillar of degrowth scholarship, economic democracy. Democratize workplaces, democratize public services, democratize the media. We know empirically that when people have democratic control over production, they choose to use resources more wisely. They focus on what is required for human welfare, and they sustain ecosystems into the future. Radical democracy is the antidote to a socially and ecologically destructive economy. It should therefore come as no surprise that core degrowth policies happen to be wildly popular. Universal services, a job guarantee, working time reduction, living wages, an economy focused on well-being and ecology rather than growth, polls and surveys repeatedly show strong majority support for these ideas, and official citizens' assemblies in Spain and France recently have called for the very policies that I've mentioned. With this path, we can build a more efficient, more rational, more just economy that is capable of ensuring good lives for all with less energy and resource use. People often say that 1.5 degrees is dead. There's no feasible path to sufficiently rapid decarbonization. But this is only true if we assume continued growth in rich countries. If we liberate ourselves from this assumption, then 1.5 degrees is back on the table. Models show that with a post-growth, post-capitalist transition, we can achieve our ecological goals and improve social outcomes at the same time. It is technologically feasible, ecologically coherent, socially just, and anti-colonial. That is a future worth fighting for. And fight we must, because none of this will happen on its own. It will require an extraordinary struggle against those who benefit so prodigiously from the existing structure of the economy. But so has every struggle for a better world. Thank you.
Thanks, Jason. Um, I just want to ask you again, just a, a clarifying before we go into a debate. Can you just define for us when you say degrowth, what you mean by the term degrowth? Because it's something that's often misunderstood, mischaracterized, whether willfully or, or unintentionally misunderstood. So can you just say for the room and for the sake of our discussion here, what, when you're talking about degrowth, what is it you're actually advocating? So it can basically be, be defined as a, a kind of planned and democratic uh, reduction of less necessary forms of production in rich countries to bring economies back into balance with the living world in a safe, just and equitable way. I think that hopefully captures the core values of this literature. So it's a planned reduction of less necessary consumption. Well, in, we focus on production, actually. OK, production, because, yeah, OK, yeah. production in rich countries. That's right. In a just way. That's right. Great. OK, so I'm just holding that. And I want to ask you, because you said in rich countries, can I just therefore say, and so if somebody from Turkey, a middle income country, or Malawi, a low income country said, so it, what does degrowth mean for us? Just, just to clarify again, what would you say? I, I'm not, I'm not, this, I'm, this isn't meaning to be a long and complex question, but because you said it's for rich countries and th therefore is it not about those countries or? Well, there's no need to degrow uh, any form of throughput, uh, material or energy throughput in cases where countries are within planetary boundaries, right? Or using sustainable levels. So it would not apply to any countries um, along those lines. But we should note that um, there's a strong literature actually uh, from Global South scholars and, and economists who, also, who are also growth critical in their own regions, right? This is very powerful, particularly in Latin America. Um, and so I think that we should also create room for growth critical points of view from the, from the Global South, recognizing that forms of growth uh, in capitalist countries in the periphery uh, are destructive and damaging to, uh, to ecosystems and human well-being and are also deeply inefficient in the ways that I've described. Uh, but there's certainly no prescription coming from, uh, from the degrowth scholarship more broadly for any kind of uh, reduction in aggregate throughput in, in poorer countries. The opposite is certainly the case. Uh, and I should emphasize this. Uh, an increase in production to meet human needs is necessary in, uh, in lower income countries. Um, and including an increase in the use of energy and resources, right, to achieve core human development objectives and to, and to eradicate permanently uh, the health gap and other forms of uh, development gaps between rich countries and poor countries in terms of social indicators. Uh, that's the goal. Um, degrowth, I think, aids this. Degrowth in the rich countries aids this because it's, um, it cuts off this net appropriation of resources and energy and productive capacity from the, from the South that presently constrains uh, development possibilities, right, under things like structural adjustment programs and, uh, and so on. So uh, addressing that is, is really critical, okay, I think. Okay, great. So your definition of degrowth actually doesn't mention GDP, right? So then, it's, I mean, somebody could say, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all for a, re a reduced, you know, a planned reduction in con production and use of Earth's resources in a more equitable way. I'm, I think actually there are many people in the world who support green growth who'd say, well, I'm all for that. I just believe we can do it with a growing GDP, whereas I sense that you're saying, and I believe that if we're going for that, it won't be compatible with a growing GDP in high income countries, right? That's where we're talking about right now. And so therefore, does this come down? It, it's going to be a future empirical question as to whether or not it's possible. And of course, we can't see the future. We can only look at data from the past that's informed us up to now. But I heard you saying, yes, there's absolute decoupling of carbon emissions, just nothing like the speed and scale that's required to come back within planetary boundaries. Whereas Sam, can I just invite you to respond to that? So just on the empirics, the belief about the, the speed that's required and that's possible on carbon and beyond, you believe it is possible to have a planned reduction? Because we're all actually talking about coming back within planetary boundaries, but you're saying, yes, it will be possible to do this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I agree. It's, a, it's an empirical question in the end. You know, you just have to sort of find out whether it works or not. Uh, the speed point is interesting for me because we, we both argue in terms of speed, uh, and I don't know how we're going to empirically figure out who's, who's right here. Uh, your argument is degrowth is a faster way of solving the climate problem. My argument is degrowth is 
one of the slowest ways of solving the climate change problem because you just have too many political arguments about it. By the time you have the societal consensus for degrowth, it's too late. Okay, and that's a really interesting point of, as you said, you know, Jason said, and I, I heard exactly the same, we need it at much greater speed, but you're arguing the political transformation for people to understand what the agenda is and to get on board with the agenda and actually transform a much deeper change in the system. We can't do that at the speed that's required. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, to me, the existing arrangements and the existing narratives, including green growth, which is dominance, right, are also not working, right? I mean, you still have the same enemies that you're accusing degrowth of having. They're there. The right will accuse you of impoverishing them, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not like you're protecting yourself from those critiques, right? Um, as far as I see, look, I don't think it's necessary for politicians to stand at the podium and call for degrowth. I think the degrowth is critical as an analytical term. Uh, it, it, focus, it organizes our thoughts. It focuses our minds on what's wrong with our economy and what needs to change, right? Uh, but there's a variety of different words or slogans that one could use and, and are already in use um, at the level of political parties calling for, and again, the word is not, is not important when it comes to, uh, to political communication, calling for the policies that I've outlined, which are popular, right? Now, um, this, uh, the, the idea of consensus, I think it will be easy to establish a consensus uh, among the people who will benefit from, this, uh, from these sorts of policies. But we're not, gonna, we're not aiming for it, and we will not succeed in winning a consensus with those who presently block these kinds of policies, right? And I don't think we should try. I think we're at a point now where we have to, we have to start building the social movements and political movements necessary to unseat those people, right? Um, so I don't know. I guess I approach it a bit differently. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not here to convince Bill Gates uh, of the value of these policies or Elon Musk, et cetera. Uh, I consider them to be a problem, and I think we need to build movements um, capable of of changing the world, um, changing our societies. And this has been done before and must be done again. Uh, and for and I think it's difficult for us to grasp um, what's required because we, most of us here in the room have grown up in an era where social organizing is not a major feature of our society. But, but we can draw inspiration and knowledge from the anti-colonial struggle of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s from the civil rights movement in the USA, from the labor movement in the of the 1940s, these from, the, from the movement for women's suffrage, these, these, these movements changed the world <laughs> permanently. Um, and, and that's the scale of transformation I think we need to start achieving. Uh, and, and that doesn't happen easily. And we don't have a lot of time. And I think that's what we need to focus the mind on here. OK, Sam, do you want to respond? Yeah, and I think we sort of agree on the on the sort of the weightless economy, the direction towards a weightless economy. If you can build an economy that uses few resources to achieve the same level of prosperity, um, I don't think too many people will be against that, and you can sell that one politically quite easily. Um, you could probably also sell the the sort of the technological fixes, uh, but they do cost money. You know, there's a lot of investment needed in the infrastructure that uh, turns current cars into electric cars and so on. Um, I sort of one other point I want to make, it's just probably a definitional one. A lot of what you sort of said, Jason, wasn't actually about degrowth. It was about other things where we can have a debate about, um, you know, capitalism, uh, income distribution. Um, you know, we, we certainly agree that the income distribution in the world isn't the way it should be. Uh, I'm not sure that just redistributing income gets you to solve the problem. I'm also not convinced that redistributing income is a terribly easy thing. I noticed you sort of, Turkey, we don't know where Turkey is on the, you know, can they grow, can they not grow, but uh, the UK is in a can't grow camp. And we, we are actually currently going through a phase of degrowth. That's exactly what the cost of living crisis is. And, and uh, you just see the political dynamics that comes out of it. We are degrowing for all the wrong reasons. We are not degrowing for environmental reasons, but the way it feels in the households that are worried is, is, is roughly the same. And these are very, very difficult things. Yeah, no, I, dis I disagree with this. This, is, um, this, t this to me, this is analytically messy, actually, because what's happening now is basically a cost of living crisis um, and a recession 
produced by a capitalist growthist economy right? that, is, that is failing us. Um, to call it degrowth is just is anal is analytically nonsense. I mean, we have recessions every 10 years. That's not degrowth, it's a recession. We have to have different categories for different things. Degrowth is very clearly described in the literature, very clearly defined. There's nothing planned about what's happening here. There's nothing just about what's happening here, right? There's nothing about decommodification or decolonization, et cetera, the, the core goals that we're after. What's being, what's being reduced is is poor people's livelihoods, which is exactly the opposite. So, I mean, effectively, there's a constraint on the consumption of working class people. This is exactly the opposite of what degrowth scholarship calls for, which is constraints on the consumption of rich people and of capital, right? So I think we have to be very clear about that. Um, sure, so can I, can I ask sure. you, the poorest 10% or the poorest 20% in the UK with the lowest income deciles, can they grow or should they degrow? Of, I mean, of course, the, they, they can't access basic goods now. They can't access, I mean, have you seen the, the, the sort of housing conditions that people live in in this country? I, I live right next to a council state. I know I see it every day, right? It's, it's absolutely abominable. And this, is hap this has happened as a result of policy during a period of incredible growth, incredible capital accumulation. So I'm over this, to be honest. Um, uh, what, what's essential, as I pointed out, is to mobilize production around meeting people's needs at a good standard. We're abolishing poverty here, right? There's no reason for us to have it. We're abolishing income insecurity. There's no reason for us to have that. Um, so we have to focus on, on what's required uh, in that respect. To the question of speed, I, I want to briefly address this. The UK is often held up as a, um, a climate progressive nation. And of course, there's no question they've made great, great strides in reducing emissions. Um, but, uh, but the rate of emissions reduction is not in line with 1.5 degrees and a minimal conception of climate justice or equity. Um, in fact, uh, it's, about, it's at least a factor of two off, uh, including climate ple uh, pledges. And, and this is demonstrated by a recent paper by Kevin Anderson in 2020. Um, right now, there's no country, not even Sweden, that's on track for 1.5 degrees uh, with a minimal conception of equity. Um, so, in terms of speed, we're failing, that, and that, that's the reality. Uh, and that's before you account for, um, for claims about negative emissions technology, et cetera, which the UK government does rely on. Um, and can I ask Sam a, a question building on that? So, the data that Jason's citing is saying that there's no country in the world that has the rate of just carbon emissions reduction that's required for 1.5, for example. And yet the, the, the framing of green growth is very strong and very prominent and you know the World Bank and the IMF and all the governments it's it's spoken as if it's already a thing but I think the argument here is it's not yet existing on the scale that's required to justify its name so what gives people the confidence that it will be achieved in the future if we if there's no evidence yet that it's achievable on the speed and scale that's required not just on carbon emissions but on material footprints I mean, uh, the, the sort of the cost of the decarbonisation path we are going through will be, you know, will be an empirical question. We'll find out just how, how costly it, it, it is. But there, there is a climate change is for me, uh, as I said, one of the, the problems we, we can solve within the, the sort of the, the growth paradigm, uh, because there, there are nations that are that are decarbonising or not they're decoupling their emissions from their from their GDP. There are issues related to consumption emissions versus production emissions, but we can see uh, we can, we can see, see emissions coming down. We can also see the and they're coming down too slowly. We, we we can agree on that, but we can also see the path. We can see the the technologies, the investments, the possibilities that would accelerate that speed. We we know we understand what we have to do. We understand what we can do to the car fleet to turn it over. We can understand how we can electrify the economy and then use that clean electricity uh, to, to clean up other sectors of the economy. Those are all sort of scenarios that have been modeled and stress tested. And the, the, the thing that's holding them back actually isn't the technology or the behavioral unwillingness, it's the political will. And, and it is that political will we have to, we have to work on technologically. Uh, there's a, a good line of uh, one of the people who sort of study these things uh, uh, very thoroughly, Adair Turner, uh, who the first uh, 
chair of the climate change committee who sort of has that flippant remark that sort of says if you make me dictator of the world i will solve the problem for you because i have my blueprint i know exactly what i have to do um of course you shouldn't make anybody dictator of the world but what what, what he means by that is that it is a question of political dynamics as opposed to technological discovery. Do you want to respond to that on the, on the technological possibilities, whether yeah. it's on carbon emissions or on other ecological impacts? Um, yeah, so, so I was at pains in my talk to, to point out the, the various measures that green growth scenarios modeled by the IPCC rely on to accomplish green growth, right? And there's, I mean, the, tr the, the truth is there's, a sci there's an emerging scientific consensus against uh, many of these core assumptions, which I outlined, right? Um, we, we simply can't rely on negative emissions technologies to that extent. We can't, uh, we can't justly suppress energy use in the global south, um, et cetera, et cetera. We need, um, we, need a, we need a feasible conception of technological change and efficiency improvements. There's an amazing paper published by some colleagues of mine in, in Nature recently um, on 1.5 degrees and how if we assume more reasonable rates of technological change, which are, which are more in line with, with what we understand empirically to be feasible, then something like a dramatic reduction in energy use in rich countries is required. And then the, the question becomes, who suffers that energy use reduction? I mean, if, that, if, if, that's, if that's necessary, then, then who's that imposed on, right? Under our existing arrangement, it will be and already is being imposed on poor people, on the working classes, right? We see that here in the UK. We see that in France. Um, and that's not acceptable. We have to fight against that. Um, we want to get rid of other forms of, of, uh, of energy, specifically related to forms of production that are just not necessary or organized primarily around capital accumulation, right? I mean, it's, it's madness to be devoting energy to producing SUVs um, in the middle of a climate emergency. Now, the thing is, uh, you talk about political will. The thing is that we know, there's, we know there's strong majority consensus around what needs to be done and how to achieve it. Uh, so in a real democracy, that would happen. If we had a democratic economy, we would not be in this situation, almost guaranteed. Um, so who blocks it? Uh, th the concern is that even many of the policies that green growth has called for, such as very high carbon taxes and so on, um, those are also blocked. By who? By people who would, uh, who, would, who would lose out in such a situation because it makes growth more difficult to achieve. It makes capital accumulation more difficult to achieve, right? Um, and so when we think about this question of political will, uh, I think the question is whose will do we need to, to shift here? <laughs> right? Whose will do we need to shift? And um, I very briefly want to address this, uh, a claim you made in your talk, uh, where you say that's, that's, that the richer people are, the more they care about climate change, right? E effectively, or in higher GDP countries, GDP per capita, you're more likely to care about climate change. This is not true. Um, if that's the case, then why are indigenous people in the Amazon or across Latin America and in Africa and in Asia fighting with their lives against climate change and ecological breakdown, right? The poorest people on the planet care more than anyone here can bring themselves to because for them, it's life or death, right? They see this, uh, this reality very starkly. Um, so that theory about income being <laughs> associated with, with concern for the climate, I don't buy. Okay, can I, and can I bring that back to mm. Sam? Is that, was that the point you were making? Yeah, no, uh, it was a slightly different point. Uh, it's, uh, first of all, we agree on the SOV, SUV things. We can sort of uh, <laughs> legislate them out of existence. I don't have a problem with that. Um, the, the, um, I sort of made the point of cyclical, uh, you know, business cycle as opposed to structural fluctuations. People get at the bottom, in the middle of a recession, at the bottom of the business cycle, people are not very keen on the environment. Yes. That's, 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 that's sort of an empirical thing. Okay, so thing. you're agreeing on that. That's <laughs> valuable to note. No, 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 really, really. No, it's that's true. Valuable, yeah. it's, it's true, and actually this is a very important point. It's, it's absolutely right that at the bottom of the business cycle, people don't support environmental policies. They support things that are much more necessary for their daily survival, right? But we want to abolish the business cycle, right? Why should we put up with that? Um, so we want an economy where people don't end up having to wonder how they're going to pay for food or heating in their homes, right? We have an economy that can provide those things. It just doesn't because it's not controlled democratically. When you abolish insecurity of livelihood through what I called for, job guarantees, shorter working weeks, um, universal public services, affordable housing, et cetera, 
then you, let you el eliminate that concern, don't you? And that's very powerful, that's very liberating. If people aren't concerned about daily life, then they can and they will care about, about climate because we know that's high on their agenda. So let's deal with that problem. Okay. Can I say yes. something about democracy? Um, I mean, we, we're all in favor of empowering people and making it democratic and, and, and you know, having people having a say. And I, I like uh, citizens' assemblies. I think those are powerful, good things. The counter example that I often use, I grew up in Switzerland, which is sort of thinks democracy to its bitter end with this sort of four referendums a year. And within, within Switzerland, one of the most democratic places is a, is a little area called Appenzell, where democracy entails physically people meeting in the town squares and voting about stuff. And they do that four or five times a year. So you can't make it much more directly democratic than that. It also happens to be the place that introduced the right of vote to women in 1991 because the men would meet on the town square and vote against it and the argument was if the women were there there wouldn't be enough space on the town square and, and it was, you know, it was <laughs> irrational so you can't, you can't always sort of rely on people having your opinion as well every now and then they have opinions that you wouldn't share Okay, and just we are going to, you're going to have more time to discuss, but when I open up to questions, I know they will bring out more points that you'll both want to make. So on the point about people's opinions, I'm going to ask you both a really difficult question and I invite everybody in the room to ask yourself this question. I want to ask you each to say, what would it take for you to change your mind? Like, and we can give, you know, decades here, yourselves going forward, what would it take Sam, for you to say, what would you need to see, experience, uh, logically deduce for yourself, um, have an epiphany about or not see, for you to say, actually, you know what? I actually no longer believe that green growth is going to be possible to secure a thriving future. And while you think about that, and then Jason, I'm gonna ask you, what would it actually take for you to say, you know that, that that definition of degrowth that you speak to, what would it take for you to believe, for example, that it's not going to be feasible without growth or that something that would make you say, I actually, I'm going to let that go. It's never going to happen. The narrative's not going to happen. Or for whatever reason, you lose your conviction that you speak with that this is the way forward, okay? Mm. Sam, can I ask you first? And, I, and, and actually, this is a really, I, I thank, I said to both of them before I was going to ask this question. It's a very, very generous thing to be able to discuss. And I invite everybody to imagine if you were asked this question on a topic you're passionate about, so. Yeah, it's, it's, I suppose I need the passage of time and a lot of observation. If we, if we sort of have that, that scenario where we really respect uh, planetary constraints, climate constraints mm. in, in the thing we talked about. So we really go ahead and we, we put in place the policies and the investment and, 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 and all the things that you know, the decarbonisation plans have in it. Um, and, and then you, one or two things happen, either emissions don't come down mm. or people sort of cancel the policies. Uh, then eventually you have to sort of admit defeat and sort of say the decarbonisation plan didn't work, we have to do something else. Whether that's some, what that something else is at that point, we'll have to see. It could. But isn't it very possible that you put those plans in place and the emissions are coming down, but there's no growth? Well, then, yeah, then, that, that, right. that is possible. That's an empirical observation. Yes, yeah. right. Okay, just that was a, the third <laughs> possibility. That right. So it's possible. So you'd want you'd you'd say you'd change your mind if you if after some time you're just not seeing the the IEA's projections saying we can do this, we can do this with growth. That just starts to not materialise. Yeah, I mean, if emissions come down, we should all celebrate. And if uh, you know, GDP will be what it is. And can I just follow on with that? You said earlier, um, I think growth can go on a little longer. And with that, you actually have to uh, I was waiting never leave one. the house without a hose pipe. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, this is the story of GDP. I'm doing it for the room. Uh, G, you know, this is how every politician and economist has spoken, that GDP growth, it, it goes up and up and up. And what I heard you say is it can go up, but at some point we should expect it to level off. Now, you're in good company there. Adam Smith said the same. Uh, um, 
John Stuart Mill said the same, John Maynard Keynes, I would say, said the same, that yes, growth, and at some point, we'll get beyond. And so you said, I think growth can go on a little longer, and I'm gonna, this is a really tough question, so just speculate as much as you like. Like, how much longer? Are we talking, we can do this through to 2050? So, you know, could we have an era of green growth with the speed that we need, that works politically, but then after that, then we need to go to a, a no growth future. Would it be after 2050? Or are you thinking sort of, well, well after 2100? Just a sense of, because you said that, many economists won't say that, that, well, of course, at some point it's gonna to come to an end. So I just wanted to get a sense of the time scale you were thinking about that on. Yeah, that's a difficult one. See how one ducks it. Um, uh, 2050, definitely we can go up to 2050. Okay. That's uh, uh, on climate grounds. So I don't think that's, that's uh, I think that I'm confident about that. I would also sort of observe that Adam Smith was, got his time frame wrong. Thomas Maltus got his time frame wrong. Uh, everybody who's sort of, you know, Stan, William Stanley Chevin's worried about UK prosperity when we run out of coal. He got that one wrong. Um, so, so far we, we have been too pessimistic. Um, so I would say we, we probably have, yeah, definitely till 2050. Uh, but there is quite a lot going wrong now. I mean, we've got growth, <laughs> but it's not looking good, right? It's not going well. Yeah, but we have the blueprint on doing it right. Okay, Within so that's your conviction. We, we, can, we can have a, a, a sort of a plan that solves the problem and we won't be poorer in 2050. Okay, because there's a lot of problems to turn around already. Okay, Jason, I know you'd love to respond to yes, that. I'm going to, I, no, I'm going to, <laughs> no, I'm going to ask you to do the same generosity as Sam. What would it take for you to say, actually, I'm no longer going to pin my colors to degrowth because it's not delivering. I'm, I'm going to stand for something else. Um, yeah, so I actually think I think about this question a lot, mm. and so I'm glad you asked it, because mm. the truth is that I used to be a green grocer. Um, <gasps> well done. <laughs> so this is just an aberration, isn't it? It's just a, a, a cyclical blip. <laughs> you, can, you can read the story in, uh, in the... Um, in the final part of my book, uh, what's it called? The last, not the preface, but the end. Epilogue. Epilogue. The afterward, or afterward. whatever. Epilogue, okay. yeah, whatever it's called. In sure. the end of Less is More. In the end of Less is More, I actually tell the story, I think. Um, and it has to do with, I mean, I might as well tell it now, I suppose, since it's kind of fun. Um, so, so there's a good feminist angle to this, actually. Uh, my partner and I had gone to a talk at LSE by um, uh, Paul Krugman who I was enamored with at the time, uh, because I felt, you know, uh, he's a progressive economist, he's saying things that I agree with, um, et cetera, et cetera. And one of his main things was we have to get out of the recession uh, by stimulating growth in the economy. Um, and I was like, yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, obviously, the economy needs growth. Uh, I just assumed this as like a basic feature of the economy. It has to happen. I mean, we're taught this when we study economics, right? I had never questioned it. Um, and as we were walking home, my partner asked me, um, uh, why do you think that the UK and US economies need more growth when countries that have less GDP per capita than they do have better social outcomes, right? And I, I, I mansplained in the worst <laughs> way. Um, I went on and on about how, no, it's necessary, you don't understand the economy. But that question was like a brain, a brain bug for me. <laughs> I couldn't get over it. I realized I've never asked this question before. And it set me on a, a very long path of, of research that remains my work today. Um, and I'm going to bring you back to my question. And, and I'm going to mention that. Great. Yeah. So, so if, I saw, if I saw evidence um, in the existing mitigation models and also to do with, with material use and so on, that, uh, that continued growth in rich, in rich nations was necessary for improved social outcomes, as in there's no other way to, improve, to, to get rid of poverty, for example. No other way to end child poverty in the UK, but through more growth, right? If I saw that, and also saw that it's also feasible technologically, and without screwing anybody in the global south, um, to bring throughputs down to sustainable levels, back within planetary boundaries, then why not? Why not, right? What's wrong with such a vision? Why would anyone be against that? Um, and, and so 
And so yes, and so if I see something that's technologically feasible, ecologically coherent, and socially just, then I'll embrace it. But Absolutely. you haven't seen it and you don't. But I haven't. Right. Yeah, but I haven't. Right. But I haven't. And I look for it every day because that's my job. <laughs> because every day I face people that despise my point of view. And that's a, that's a hard life. Mm. I really. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh. You laugh. You it's laugh, a hard, it's hard life. Like it, On it, both no, sides. No, it takes a real toll. It takes a real toll. Um, and so I'm, I, I read everything that people throw at me. And I'm, I'm ready to change my mind. And I, and I don't see it yet. Um, OK. And I'm going to ask you the same. Tough question about mm -hmm. the hose pipe. So let's just say uh, UK, US, a high income economy, right? This is generally with, with some business cycle in here that I can't crinkle into a hose pipe. This has generally been the direction of high income economies. GDP is just rising more slowly than it used to, but rising. So what do you think for a thriving future on planet Earth, for humanity and the living world, what do you expect is the going to be the necessary shape of GDP in countries like the UK and the US? Could they plateau out, say, let's say from now, we could just go level? Or would you say that's just got to, not enough, it's going to have to go dip? Or are you going to say to me, it doesn't matter what happens to GDP? Mm -hmm. Which, which what, what? So I mean, it's very, very difficult to predict. And I'm not saying this as a cop out. Let me explain why. Because GDP is ultimately a measure of, of market prices, right? And so depending on how we change the economy, depending on the balance of power between labor and capital, depending on the extent of decommodification, then GDP could be different. But all that being said, um, it seems pretty clear to me that with the kind of policies that we call for, um, it's likely that GDP is going to decline in rich countries, right? And that's OK, because what matters, again, is not aggregate production as measured in market prices. Okay, but rather, again, what we're producing and whether people have access to what they need. And as long as we're guaranteeing that, then we're not worried about it. But we need to be prepared. And right now, here's the problem. Even a minor disruption in GDP growth in our economy is catastrophic. We're seeing that now, right? We saw that during the pandemic. Um, and so if it's true that, that Sam introduces policies that, in, that, de that do decarbonize, but also don't lead to growth or maybe even lead to less growth, and if we're not prepared for that, people will get hurt. And we can't let that happen, right? And so um, not only that, but also our political enemies will immediately get rid of us. If you sell a story that what we're going to do in terms of decarbonization will also lead to growth, and it doesn't lead to growth, you're out, right? They, they'll get you on your own criteria. So why sell that story? Okay. Promise decarbonization and good, decent lives for all within planetary boundaries. That, that should be the narrative that we have. Great. OK, I've got my eye on the clock, which is moving too. That's one thing that does have the speed that's too fast. <laughs> I'm going to open this up to the room. Hand to shoot up. OK, so before I ask, I invite you to ask questions that will deepen our understanding here, our collective understanding for what's going on, what's really being discussed, enrich what we're seeing. OK, yes. And, and if you want to say, to one person or another. You don't both have to answer both. We have 11 minutes, people. So I ask for brief questions and concise answers. Hi, thanks. Hello. Okay, it's fine. Um, hi, thanks both for the great talk. I think there's a lot going on here about what should be done normatively and also what is, should be done realistically or feasibly. And potentially the question should have been how free should markets really be? Um, but the question I have for uh, Jason now is basically you outlined that for decades we've been promised uh, this sort of green growth is the solution narrative. But also for decades and centuries we've been promised that the class revolution will come and if only we all <laughs> unite as workers, like everything will be solved. Uh, and you outlined this very clear like class divide, the 1% and everybody else. But what about the middle class that's quite comfortable and like not willing to make sacrifices? I mean, I study one of the courses which probably people who care the most about climate change study, and many of us still travel. We're not willing to give up sacrifices and such. So yeah, thank if you, you could answer that, thank you. Um, it's a very good question. Um, look, I think that's uh, that's... For me, uh, I mean, I have to rely on the empirical evidence that we have. Um, and so when I see uh, surveys indicating strong majority support for things like we want an economy that actually prioritizes ecology and human well-being over economic growth or even at the expense of economic growth, I think that's a powerful finding. Um, when we see democratically 
selected or randomly selected citizens assemblies coming up with these same ideas. That's powerful. And there's a recent, a recent Nature paper that I find very inspiring. It finds that about 70% of people, um, when given direct control over how to manage a resource, will choose to sustain it for future generations, um, even if it means taking a financial, an immediate financial loss for themselves. Right? Um, now, of course, there's a selfish minority, 30%. But in, in a democratic situation, they get overridden. right? Um, and in fact, you can even bring them on board through democratic de uh, deliberation. So I really do think that democracy becomes crucial here. Um, so that's the most I can say. And I'm open to more evidence, and I, and I look for it as well. So please, please feel free to send it my way. Great. Thank you. Yes. Gentleman, the second row at the back. Yes. That's right, you. Yes. Could you pass mm. the microphone to him? Mm. It's just coming. Hang on. Yes, thank you very much for the great talk. My question is from Professor Sam. Can you speak very uh, loudly so everyone Yes, my question is for Professor Sam. You were talking about uh, achieving green growth within the planetary boundaries. Uh, but when we look at the IPCC report and all the scenario to achieve net zero by 2050, they are all relying on geoengineering solution. And from the climate scientist perspective, we don't know how the climate system will react. So we don't yet know the climate feedback of the system. So how, how are you attending as a Green Gulf scholar to achieve net zero by 2050 if we don't know how the climate system will react to those mitigation solution? Thank you. Great question, thank you. Yeah, it was a very good question. Thank you for it, because I was sort of waiting for the opportunity to say something about net zero, the net in net zero. Uh, first of all, the term geoengineering needs to be defined. If you're sort of talking about things like solar radiation management, that's scary stuff, don't go there. <laughs> if, if, you talk, if you talk about uh, greenhouse gas removal, that's not so scary stuff. Do go there. Um, um, let, me, let me sort of <laughs> explain what I mean by that. Um, you write them, all the models have sort of a, a, an element of negative emissions in them to, to make them work. And that's sort of inbuilt in the term net zero. If you don't like the negative emissions, you don't talk about net zero, talk about gross zero. Um, so that sort of negative it is in there. You, you can do that through tree planting, for example. So that's a relatively tested technology. Um, the, 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 sort of the worry you have to have there is the permanence of it. Um, you know, the, the, the fossil fuel in the ground has been there for thousands of years. That sort of means that the forest has to be there for the same thousand of years. And you have to worry about the sort of ecological context in which that forest exists. Um, you know, the pests and diseases and, uh, and all those sorts of things that might happen to the forest. So there is a case for, and we're doing research on that, on, on sort of more uh, geological storage and, and technology carbon capture and storage. And you're right, those things are, are, they only exist in sort of small scale pilot, uh, 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 pilot uh, uh, installations. Um, but, uh, you know, we need, we need to do to that technology uh, the same as we've done to offshore wind, which used to be expensive, to batteries, which used to be expensive, to solar, which used to be expensive. The reason why I say that is not because this is the first and main thing you should do. This is our insurance policy. This is what we have to do if for some reason, and we can sort of imagine what those reasons might be, if we don't bring emissions down fast enough. It's the same, you know, the best remedy against uh, heart problems is, is a healthy lifestyle. Doesn't mean open heart surgery is necessarily a bad thing as a backstop. That's the sort of thing we're talking about. Great, thank you. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, my question to Jason. Um, so two weeks ago, um, uh, the Guardian reported that African countries are some African countries are planning to expand their uh, fossil fuel production in order to deal with the energy crisis and um, provide development. What would be your stance on such an announcement? Um, yeah, what would you be a stand, considering the fact that those countries have historically not contributed to a problem, but this is not in line with the 1.5 goal? What would be your response to those countries? Um, yeah, I don't think anyone could ever in their right mind blame any poor country for expanding fossil fuel use if necessary. 
Um, so that's, yeah, I, I mean, who would say that? <laughs> uh, th that said, I think that there are much, uh, there are other factors we need to account for and push for, right? Um, we need climate reparations for the global south uh, urgently and on a very large scale um, to ensure that, that they can achieve also a rapid transition to renewables, right? If that is difficult for them financially, then we need reparations to ensure that can be achieved. And that should include also uh, ending patents on essential technologies that, that may be required. Uh, so I would start with these, right? There should be an urgent international effort to ensure that there are no obstacles to any Global South governments pursuing energy sovereignty through renewable energy. Um, so I would start there. Uh, and look, look also, I, I really worry about the, uh, the appropriation of energy in the Global South. We know that huge amounts of energy in the Global South are appropriated effectively to service capital accumulation in the Global North. This is a totally irrational and unjust use of energy uh, resources, right? Global South countries should have the right and the ability uh, to, to reclaim their energy resources and other forms of productive capacity and organize that around meeting human needs. Um, and what's very exciting is that we know that that's, uh, through bottom-up uh, modeling studies, like a recent one by, by Joel Millard Hopkins and uh, Julia Steinberger, that um, it's possible to, to meet human needs at a good standard universally around the world for 10 billion people um, with significantly less energy than the world presently uses, right? About 60% less, depending on your assumptions about technology, um, which we can change. Uh, and that's, that's very exciting news, right? But it requires a much more equitable distribution of energy, and I think that has to be front and center. So, so I would approach the question that way, I think, from a, a more justice-oriented angle. Great. Joy, can we run over five minutes? Yeah, the room up for that? Yeah, everyone good with that? Yeah. OK. Yes, Daniel. No, no, wait a moment. Wait for the mic. I'm coming. Yeah, hello. Thank you for the talk. Very, very cool. So my question is about the the global nature of capitalism, right? So basically, the fact that if investment goes down in certain country, then the rich people would go somewhere else. So just to have investment and the tax havens and all what's happening around this global nature of capitalism. So in that sense, like my question to Jason would be, do you see this movement behind degrowth having to be structured throughout the sovereignty necessarily of a country? Or do you see it as having to happen like in a more like not sovereign country kind of way? Because like, for example, what has happened a lot in Latin America has been that the countries that start going very hard in some left uh, left sided policies, the, all of the investment goes down there. And then like they become unviable for various reasons. So like, okay. that's like my question to you. Great, great question. It's a very good question. Um, and look, I should actually take this moment to emphasize that degrowth scholarship does not have all the answers and there are many research questions that remain to be explored. Um, and I hope that some of you at least will, will pursue some of those questions because we, we need much more scholarship on this. And this is actually one of them, right? Uh, there, there are real geopolitical questions about, about first mover uh, disadvantage and about free riders and so on. Um, if the UK um, uh, is fortunate enough to have a government that prioritizes eco-social policy um, and this leads to a decline in GDP and say a decline in, uh, in their power within the World Bank and IMF where GDP counts for a lot or their, their military power if, if that's a concern, um, then does it, this raises questions about, uh, about uh, competitive advantage. Um, I think, and look, I don't have answers to this, but I think that um, something like the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is important here. We need international collaboration on this in the same way that we have it already around, to some extent, around climate. Uh, so an international agreement where the rich countries lead on this is essential. Now, that's a, that's a tall ask. Um, but let me say this. The question about capital flight doesn't worry me too much. There, there are, there are well-known strategies for preventing that or dealing with it such as capital controls, right? Which were used regularly and even advocated by people like Keynes uh, in the middle of the 20th century. There's no reason we can't bring those back on, um, even though it is unthinkable for anyone who grew up with a neoliberal mindset, right? That's okay, we can change our mindsets. Um, the other thing here is that uh, I'm not too worried about, about capital moving finance abroad necessarily, because 
ultimately money or finance uh, is simply an abstract representation of control over productive capacity, labor and resources, real productive capacity, right? I think MMT scholarship is very strong on this, that, uh, that, that, put, that governments that have sovereign command over their currency can, can issue the public currency in a way that allows them to mobilize uh, productive capacity towards democratically ratified social goals, right? Thereby, thereby effectively constraining uh, the, the, um, the control that capital has over our national economy. So I guess, I guess that's how I'd address it. But again, these, these questions have not been dealt with extensively in the literature, and perhaps, uh, perhaps you can advance that. Can, can yes, I, absolutely. Yeah, make a comment on, on capitalism. Uh, for me, first of all, that's not exactly the same thing as growth. Second, uh, there is 90% of, of, of companies in, uh, in, in, in the developed world, certainly, probably in the world as a whole, are SMEs, are small and medium sized enterprises. So the sort of the, the portrayal of, of the global economy as a sort of, you know, the private equity uh, 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 guys, uh, sort of, you know, barbarians at the gate type economy, that's not the way the economy actually looks. Most of, most of the economy is SMEs, over half of people uh, work in SMEs, so it's a slightly different form of, of economic model than, uh, than, than many of us imagine. Then the second point is, is the one about investment. Investment is actually something we need more of. Um, we both sort of tended to agree that uh, technology, the right type of technology, clean technology, is, is part of the solution, is a good thing. Um, that technology has to be invested in. And, and uh, you know, uh, a lot of the technologies we, we are talking about are capital intensive, uh, that they're expensive to buy and cheap to run. Uh, a solar or a wind farm is probably a better example, is expensive currently to buy and set up. You need capital for that. It's incredibly cheap to run. You don't have any fuel cost. An electric car, same thing. The battery is expensive, incredibly, at the moment, quite expensive to buy, incredibly, incredibly cheap to run. So you do need a lot of capital. You do need a lot of investment to get those technologies that we both think we need to get those going. That sounds like, like we need an era of green growth, but then you're saying perhaps we can have actually an economy that doesn't depend upon endless growth because you need upfront investment, but then it's very cheap to run. Again, that's an empirical question. An empirical question. <laughs> no, no, I, th I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important one, actually, because um, clearly if you're investing in something like wind farms and solar, and solar energy, those sectors clearly will grow. And that's a good thing. I think we can all agree, right? Um, we also need to grow public transit in terms of the actual production of the trains that we need, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we need to decommodify it as well, but that's a different story. Uh, but, but, but that's quite different from saying that, we, that, we, that, that this will create or that we want aggregate growth, which is worrying because aggregate growth means, again, more energy demand, which actually works against the goals of decarbonization. So we, we do want growth in those sectors, but we should worry about calling for aggregate growth. We actually don't, we actually don't want that. Um, so let's scale, again, scale down less necessary sectors while we actually improve socially necessary ones. So I'm afraid the clock says five past seven. I know, we, we're only just getting, and, and I, I just want to acknowledge that both Sam and Jason are engaging in this such a way that we are, are going deeper and, and uncovering and, and the questions are coming and this is a very rich space. I'm going to invite both of them just to give a final reflection, recognizing that we have to wrap up. One thought that they want to leave you with, one thought that may have occurred to them in this conversation, in the spirit of how can we be so curious about how we respectfully disagree. What is it we're disagreeing on? And again, this isn't just a question to them. This is a question to every one of us to understand our own views, the reasons that we hold our convictions and what it would take to change our own minds. Would you like to go, Sam? OK, so the first thing to, I think we sort of agreed we, on, on the objective, as it were. We have sort of have a dashboard of indicators that we care about which include prosperity, which include fairness, which include inclusivity and, and, and all those. And that's, we sort of agree on that. The sort of the disagreement probably is how one, how one gets there. And in, 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 in my sort of opinion, um, more income is associated with many of those things that we care about. Uh, so that's sort of one observation I would make. 
The other observation I would reiterate is the political point that uh, I'm a pragmatist. We, there's a problem we have to solve, and I don't quite care how we solve it really, as long as we do it fast. Um, and sort of my sense is that the green growth narrative is a much easier way of uh, selling the, the solutions to the problem politically. You sort of said at some point, if I promise green growth and then it doesn't happen, I get voted out. If I promise degrowth, I don't get voted in in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jason, do you want to just give us your final reflection yeah. for this moment? Um. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, sh I should first say, I I'm very grateful for this space because it's, it's nice to have a civilized conversation with a colleague <laughs> um, on important empirical points, which, yeah. which is difficult to have, say, on Twitter. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and thank you also, Kate, for your, for your moderation. Uh, it's, it's been really helpful, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, look, I think that it's true that we uh, were, were interested in solving similar problems. Um, I think that we have a different reading of, of the literature that is, a, that is addressing these questions, um, which is changing quickly. Um, I think that uh, I, I don't see uh, the promises of green growth um, panning out uh, in uh, a feasible and most importantly, just way. That's very important to me. And I think that what I see in the degrowth scholarship, I find to be more honest, right? It's not easy. It's a hard concept. It challenges you. Um, it, it forces you to, to rethink your assumptions. But I think that's good, right? Especially in university spaces where that's our job. Our job is to change the way that we think, uh, to expand our, our horizons. And I think that degrowth does a really good job of that. Um, there are big questions that still remain, right? What kinds of political movements uh, are necessary for the kind of transition we have to achieve? Um, what kinds of narratives and framing are necessary? I think these are open questions. Uh, and we don't have answers, and I think that's, uh, that this is where, this is where you, honestly, uh, come in. So I'm excited to see where, where you all take um, these issues. Great. So let me close this by saying I hope that all of you, in listening to us discuss and these two debates so openly and generously, I hope all of you appreciate more about each of these positions, especially the one you came in the room thinking you didn't agree with and can empathize with more with the reasons why somebody might hold that view. I hope each of you have listened to what are the deep reasons for disagreement, because it's in every debate that we're in. Let's listen for those and try and understand them, and let's get rid of the ones that are just misunderstandings. We're talking about different things, different definitions, different places, and then let's have more interesting reasons to disagree. And I hope each one of you has asked yourself, what would it take to change your mind on this topic and many other topics, and as Jason just said, that's what universities are for. So Sam, Jason, and to all the students who organize this debate, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.